morning, everyone. Today is June 29th, 2023, and welcome to the New Possibilities Hour, part of the Will Work for Food Project, founded by Natalie Armstrong Motan in the spring of 2020. Every Thursday morning, Jean Lawler and I are delighted to co-host another cutting edge presentation for mediators, arbitrators, lawyers, and everyone who negotiates. As you know, there's no charge for these great webinars. Rather, we ask people to contribute to a food bank if they like what they see. And our audiences have been so generous contributing in honor of our great speakers. One of my favorite parts of the webinar this, every week is when we announce the running total of contributions to food banks by our wonderful audiences. Jean Lawler, would you please do the honors? Absolutely, I would hate to disappoint you and not uh, have a number for you, Jeff. Um, well, it looks like we're getting ever closer to the half million mark, little by little. Uh, amazingly enough, we are at $411,918.57 of donations about which we've been told. So if you've made any donation and haven't told us about it and would like to do so, please send an email or a text message or just reach out to Natalie, to Jeff, or to myself, and we'll be very pleased, thrilled to add it to the total. Thank you so much. That is just fantastic. Thank you, Jean, and thanks to all of our wonderful speakers in whose honor people have contributed, and thanks to all the wonderful members of the audience who have made those generous contributions. We're very happy to have a guest today, Scott Partridge. Scott has a very distinguished record. Scott had a law firm in New Orleans, Louisiana, grew to 75 lawyers at its peak, doing high stakes commercial litigation. In 2006, Scott accepted the role of Chief Deputy General Counsel of Monsanto Company and assumed responsibility for a variety of high profile litigations including class actions, mass torts, commercial disputes, as well as investigations and litigation involving the federal and state governments. With an intense high profile litigation docket, Scott created new processes to resolve disputes while also maintaining a principled approach to advancing cases to trial. To increase the company's focus on the management of disputes, Scott moved from the law team into a business leadership role as vice president of global strategy. Leading the strategy team with a focus on dispute resolution, Scott ended decades of class action and mass tort litigation involving Monsanto's legacy manufacturing sites in West Virginia, Illinois, and Alabama, and resolved product liability class actions and business disputes. In recognition of developing these transformative programs, the International Institute for Conflict Prevention and Resolution, CPR, honored Scott in 2016 with its inaugural Inspiring Innovation Award. As the agriculture industry began to consolidate, Scott was at the forefront of negotiating and concluding the merger between Monsanto and its new parent, Bayer. For over 20 months, he helped conclude the merger with final approval by all global competition regulators. Following the combination of the two companies, recognizing Scott's unique value, Bayer asked him to serve as general counsel of Bayer US, a role he occupied from 2018 until he stepped down at the end of 22 to launch Partridge LLC. We're delighted to have you here, Scott, to talk to us about relationship-based dispute resolution and conflict prevention. So please tell us a little bit about the food bank to which you would like people to contribute if they're in a position to do so. And then tell us about relationship-based dispute resolution and conflict prevention. Scott Partridge, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, with you all. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this discussion and want to leave plenty of time at the end for uh, dialogue. Um, so Second Harvest Food Bank in New Orleans. I lived in New Orleans for 45 years, uh, was there through numerous hurricanes, starting with Hurricane Betsy and ending with Hurricane Katrina. Um, New Orleans is a, a unique American
a fairly poor and struggling population uh, that I saw struggle even more after Hurricane Katrina. So my chosen food bank is Second Harvest Food Bank in New Orleans, and I would, I would welcome and applaud any contributions that you all would be willing to make to uh, Second Harvest in New Orleans. So with that, let me move, and I'm going to tell you a story, and it's, it's a bit of a lengthy story, but I'm going to try to make it somewhat compact. It's about my journey, uh, my story predictable when I embarked on the mission. Uh, looking back, I would love to tell you that my journey was linear, and it was not. <laughs> I, uh, I started out uh, after graduating from Tulane Law School, working at a large law firm for 15 years, uh, doing litigation. I started out in the maritime field. Uh, New Orleans, a vibrant, large port, and there was plenty of maritime litigation. It was exciting. It was international. Uh, maritime litigation, I ended up moving into doing products liability work and ended up with relationships with a number of major manufacturers in the United States um, who were producing products that, uh, that resulted in, in claims and litigation. Uh, one of those clients was Monsanto. I was involved in early years with Monsanto before biotechnology in basically garden variety product liability cases. Um, Monsanto didn't have a large volume of litigation, but they had bits of, bits of uh, lawsuits all over the United States. I ended up becoming Monsanto's uh, national counsel and held that role for 15 years, handling Monsanto's litigation throughout the US, uh, handled, uh, handled litigation in every state in the United States other than Alaska. Uh, not a lot of corn and soybeans were grown in, in, uh, in Alaska. Um, I, found, I found that as I worked with Monsanto uh, and ended uh, individual disputes, one of the ways I brought value to the company was by counseling them on how to avoid similar disputes in the future. What I didn't realize I was doing was I was, I was venturing into the area of conflict prevention, and uh, we would Natalie, can you hear me? I, okay. Are we Scott, having? You're freezing uh, from time to time, Scott. Okay. Um, why don't I temporarily turn off my video, see if that helps. Does that help, Jeff? Let's try it. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see you, uh, but let's try this for a couple of minutes, and then hopefully we'll turn it back on. It okay. might do better if you um, disconnect other Wi-Fi using devices, Mr. Partridge, a cell phone, an iPad, et cetera, and allow your, um, your current video device to use all of that bandwidth. Oh, great, great idea. Okay, let's try that. I've only, there's only one video de other device, so let's, let's try this again. And let okay. me know if it freezes and I'll, uh, I'll stop the video as well. Um, the the firm I started it uh, we we enjoyed some success growing rapidly, and then we ran into a weather event in uh, the end of August 2005 with Hurricane Katrina. Um, my uh, my law office had the top five floors of a building downtown right across from the Superdome. Some of you probably recall what the Superdome looked like after Katrina, with holes ripped open in the roof. Uh, all five of my floors uh, were blown out, windows completely blown out, D desks were thrown into the street. Uh, we didn't have another satellite office, we only had one office. And uh, we lost our house. We had seven feet of water for 16 days. We had five family members lose houses. Uh, my wife and I and our boys lived in uh, nine different places over the next 12 months trying to get back to New Orleans and rebuild. Uh, one of the things I did with Katrina when Katrina hit is I, I asked my partners and associates, uh, call up your best client and see if you can co-locate with them. 
ask them to help you, give you a conference room. And the response by our clients was just astounding. Uh, one of those clients was, uh, was Monsanto and the entire ag litigation group went up to Monsanto and not only were offices provided, but Monsanto found uh, housing for them. And uh, it was a, just a remarkable, uh, remarkable gesture in partnership. Uh, surprisingly, we also had one of the best financial years in the history of the firm the year after Katrina uh, with all of the help the clients were, uh, were giving us. So about a year uh, after Katrina, I was making a tour visiting clients to thank them. And, uh, and I visited Monsanto. And uh, in the course of that visit, I was asked if I would be interested in joining the company as chief Je deputy general counsel. The then chief deputy was becoming the new GC. It hadn't been announced yet. And uh, I went home and spoke with my wife. And overnight, we made the decision that uh, we were going to move to St. Louis. So that was in 2006. And I stayed in the law department for, uh, for four years. And then uh, the CEO of the company, uh, Hugh Grant, asked me to lead a section of corporate strategy. Uh, Monsanto has uh, frequently been challenged with uh, uh, reputational issues, uh, the development of ag biotech. Uh, while it was transformational in the industry, it wasn't always widely accepted. And uh, we had a bunch of, Monsanto had a bunch of old legacy uh, litigation. Uh, involving closed manufacturing sites from what it used to be a chemical company. And my focus was trying to uh, end disputes and in particular, end, uh, end the disputes, uh, not only legacy disputes, but also end litigation across the industry. Um, when biotech, when the race was on to develop biotechnology and agriculture, uh, there were six major multinational companies that were in that race, uh, Dow, DuPont, and Monsanto, uh, the three, three American companies, BASF, Bayer, and Syngenta, two German and one Swiss company. Well, Monsanto was the first to bring a commercial product to, uh, to the marketplace and put it in the hands of farmers. And it was, uh, it, there were two products really. It was, one was in cotton and one was in soybeans. And, um, the decision we made when the, that technology was brought forward, uh, recognizing the transformational nature of it, was to um, was to broadly license it to all of our competitors. The largest competitor we had was DuPont, DuPont's ag division, Pioneer, out of Iowa, and uh, DuPont didn't really like having to license from this young upstart. Uh, group out of St. Louis, but nonetheless, it was necessary for them to maintain a competitive position in the seed business. Um, we had constant litigation across the industry. And there's, there's a system that you all have probably seen before uh, when a, an industry goes through a transformation. Uh, the first mover, the innovator, uh, will secure a new product or new developer, new process, and will patent that, that product. That's what Monsanto did. Uh, the patents end up being attacked by the competitors who didn't win the race. So we had that litigation. We were successful in in defeating that litigation, but also had a business model where we were broadly licensing. So uh, government regulators, you know, we, we didn't have at that time litigation with government regulators. The, uh, once the patent estate, some would call it a fortress, once the patent estate is secured, uh, you see antitrust attacks. You dominate the industry, you control all the patents, and hence you, must, hence you must be an antitrust monopolist. So we had that litigation as well, and were successful in that litigation. As, um, as the technology moved to its second generation, uh, the patent was expiring and new technology was being brought to bear. Uh, at Monsanto, we discovered that DuPont had, uh, and I'll use the grade school term, borrowed our second generation technology without permission. Uh, we, uh, we confronted them and said, you need to stop this. And they said, no, we're not gonna stop it. And we said, okay, then you need to take a license. And they said, no, we're not gonna take a license. Uh, and if you sue us, we're gonna complain to the Department of Justice and to state attorneys general. And this is when uh, President Obama was there, uh, Joe Biden being vice president, DuPont, uh, I'll remind you all, is a Delaware-based uh, corporation with strong 
political ties in that state. Uh, Joe Biden happened to have been a senator from the great state of Delaware. So uh, I, I, attempted, uh, I attempted to convince them to take a license, and they wouldn't. So we filed suit against them uh, in federal court in St. Louis. Within 45 days, we were met with an antitrust tech counterclaim and notice of investigation, a civil investigative demand from the Department of Justice, and shortly thereafter, a, uh, a subpoena of a civil invest and civil investigative demand led by the state of Iowa, which was uh, DuPont's agricultural unit's home state. Um, litigation proceeded, and we had over a dozen other lawsuits with DuPont at that time. We had lawsuits with Syngenta and others in the industry. Um, it was a very busy time in courthouses for Monsanto. Uh, I attempted to settle the uh, the dispute and offered a license to DuPont, but we weren't able to reach an agreement. Uh, the case went to trial in St. Louis, and uh, and it resulted in a one billion that's with a B one billion dollar jury verdict against uh, against DuPont and a finding of infringement. The antitrust case was counterclaim was uh, defeated, dismissed. Um, I waited I waited a few months and I called up the individual at DuPont Pioneer, who I had negotiated with their president, and failed failed to settle the case before trial. Uh, we called Paul. I called Paul and said, uh, I've got a billion dollar judgment. I know you're going to appeal it. I'm prepared to license you the technology that you clearly want on the same terms that uh, I offered you before trial. The only thing that will change is the price. And the price has gone up somewhat because of this verdict. Uh, he was surprised that I was willing to offer the technology since we certainly weren't obligated to. And it would have had a significant competitive impact on them not having the second generation technology in soybeans. So um, we got together. We had a host of lawyers and business people. I had breeding experts, uh, scientists with knowledge of the technology. And we met for 68 days straight and negotiated a license through the patent term of uh, through the patent term of the technology, which took it through 2027. It had a net present value of I think it was 1.7 billion and a cash value through the license of 5.1 billion. It was then the largest financial transaction in the history of Monsanto. Um, as we got to uh, as we got to uh, a point where it was clear that we were going to have a license in place, and the one billion dollar verdict was going to be resolved and vacated, um, I asked Paul at the uh, hotel where we were meeting. I said, uh, "Can I buy you a drink?" And after the day was over, we went to the bar and. Uh, and we'd spent a lot of time together, 68 days straight. And I said, Paul, I'm you know, pleased to see we're going to resolve this. We have over a dozen other lawsuits that I'd like to talk to you about. But also, importantly, I never want us to get to this place again. And he said, what do you mean? I said, we've got to find a better way of uh, competing. I said, when I think about Coke and Pepsi, they, they haven't been in litigation against each other the way we have. Uh, they compete on the store shelves. We should be competing at the farm gate, uh, competing for the business of our grower customers. And uh, he said, well, how do we do that? And I said, well, first, let's start. Let's put some teams together and let's try to end these other dozen plus lawsuits and arbitrations. So we put together um, groups, again, of lawyers and businessmen and women. And uh, we, we had used a mediator. For some of the disputes, we did it ourselves for other disputes, and uh, we resolved all of that other litigation. Uh, we then started meeting. We then started meeting uh, on a quarterly basis, and it's first started. We both brought antitrust lawyers, um, and uh, we had, of course, other lawyers, commercial lawyers, and brought businessmen and women to these meetings. And the purpose was to uh, to have a system in place that when when conflicts or disputes or disruption would occur in the relationship in the field or uh, at state capitals, 
those disputes would get elevated to this team. We called it the relationship, the relationship team. And it would be led by Paul and me. We also, we also put in, in place contracts broadly across both organizations that had the standard um, dispute resolution clause. It called for negotiation by business owners, then executive negotiation, which would be Paul and me, and, uh, and then mediation, and then arbitration in all areas other than intellectual property disputes. And I'll explain later, if you wish, an interesting way that uh, we created a process for intellectual property patent disputes. Um, what we found was as we, as we worked together and we heard of uh, disruption or disputes in the field, uh, they would be brought to our attention and what we realized was the mass, vast majority of these disputes or you know, broiling, uh, brewing disputes were a function either of misunderstanding, lack of communication, or just vigorous competition in the field. And we ended these disputes one by one. And uh, there was great motivation for the business owners to end these disputes, because if they didn't end the disputes, the disputes were brought to Paul and me. <laughs> and we would end them. And uh, it was it was definitely uh, a better program for the business owners to to terminate those disputes. Um, the system. While quarterly, we started out meeting in neutral locations, everybody had suits on and we sat across the table from each other. Um, as we ended these disputes and existing litigations, uh, we started we started having fewer lawyers attend these meetings. We always had antitrust lawyers there. And by the way, I, I informed the Department of Justice what we were doing. And I told them we would provide you with copies of the minutes of these meetings so you could see that the two largest competitors weren't uh, weren't doing things that we shouldn't be doing from a competitive standpoint. Uh, Department of Justice was very appreciative of, of that. And by the way, the investigations that DOJ and the State Attorney General Task Force opened to Monsanto in response to our lawsuit against uh, DuPont, they all disappeared. They were ended with no consent decree, no change in practice. They simply were dismissed uh, after the expenditure by Monsanto of literally tens of millions of dollars responding to their investigative demands. Um, what we found was these meetings as fewer lawyers attended and more businessmen and scientists attended. The, uh, I hosted a meeting at our headquarters and it was over lunch. And I purposely put together a series of round tables and we sat with each other. Uh, I was then invited with my team to go to a meeting at DuPont Pioneers headquarters. Uh, we weren't wearing jackets and ties anymore. The attire was casual. We actually met the evening before over dinner and had cocktails and wine with dinner. And we sat next to each other. And as uh, one of the DuPont uh, people said to me, you know, Scott, uh, it's really interesting to see that you all put your pants on one leg at a time, just like we do. And what uh, what was fascinating was the uh, their sense of their sense of values and priorities were the same as ours, putting new products in the hands of growers and uh, competing at the farm gate. Now, let me explain to you why why this process uh, why this process worked and and where we took it next. Um, I went to Syngenta. We had 14 lawsuits and arbitrations with Syngenta, the Swiss company. I told them what we had done with DuPont. And I said, I wanted to construct the same model with you. Now, the Swiss are a bit more structured, a bit more regimented than, than we were with uh, DuPont. But we formed uh, a governance team that, that uh, the Syngenta called it. And we had the same sort of process. And we ended all of our litigation and disputes with Syngenta. And we put in place this quarterly, uh, quarterly meeting process. We did the uh, new contracts, had the uh, standard negotiation, executive negotiation, mediation, arbitration, stepped uh, claims resolution process. And um, this ended up being a model that we used across the industry. 
Uh, I also watched litigation between other competitors in the industry disappear. And I certainly don't want to take credit for uh, what ended up emerging after, after 18 to 24 months. Uh, I did a search and couldn't identify any litigation across the entire industry, Dow, DuPont, BASF, Bayer, and uh, Monsanto and Syngenta. Um, I would like to think that there was a realization by, uh, by other companies that we had that uh, time, effort, and resources were better spent elsewhere. And that point, that point was driven home to me uh, when I was in strategy, uh, I traveled. I traveled a lot. I traveled around the world to places where agriculture was struggling, to uh, you know, to places where uh, food was not as abundant uh, as it is here in the United States. You know, I applaud the effort, Jeff, that you and and your team are doing, and what you're doing with food banks here in the United States. Um, there are people who struggle in the U.S. to find food. Uh, I'll tell you that those of us on this call, uh, you're going to have a choice of what you want to eat for lunch and dinner tonight. You're going to have an abundance of food and selection in restaurants and grocery stores of your choosing. In some respects, those of us who are fortunate enough uh, to afford food here in the U.S., we've, we've won the lottery. Uh, we've won the food lottery here. Uh, I traveled to places in Asia in India and South America, um, in Africa as well, uh, where people struggle to find food. In, in uh, Africa, the only sub-Saharan nation that's able to produce enough food to feed its own population is South Africa. And in rural parts of South Africa, uh, much of the food is produced on a family by family basis, usually by a woman who is poking a hole in the ground with a stick to plant one kernel of corn at a time. And that corn has, uh, has germplasm that's as robust as what our forefathers planted around the time of the Civil War. They're not in need of biotechnology. They're in need of ba basic tools and infrastructure. Uh, and that woman is planting those kernels of corn simply to feed her family the same food day after day. And as I traveled, as I traveled the globe, um, I saw things that were uh, burned into my memory. And uh, I saw children who were hungry. Uh, I saw families who were begging for food. And um, when you think of the statistics that uh, we face as a, uh, as a nation, and the ability of this country to provide food uh, for, frankly, for people around the globe. Uh, tonight, one quarter of the children in the world will go to bed hungry. And this year, about 3 million children will die of malnutrition. That's about the population of the greater metropolitan St. Louis area. And this is happening every single year. And when I think about the money that uh, we were spending, that we saved in resolving disputes with our competitors and resolving legacy manufacturing disputes, uh, we put tens of millions of dollars back into the budget to be used on the research and development of new tools to put in the hands of growers around the world to help solve this problem. I, had, uh, I didn't need any more motivation than that to do what I did, to take the risk, as I told my team, we're gonna take the risk of being right here and we're not gonna go to the safe place of not being wrong. And we took the risk of extending an olive branch to our competitors to tell them that we wanted to change the way we did business with each other. And, uh, and it worked. And it's one lesson that I've, uh, I've tried to bring to the teams I've led is that uh, uh, take those risks. 
change the dialogue. Uh, the only thing that that can happen to you if you fail is you move on to the next opportunity to take a new risk. And uh, I'm uh, I'm really pleased with uh, with what we were able to accomplish uh, to this day. There's um, there's very little litigation across the industry. It has matured uh, to a point where I do believe this industry is one that even through consolidation, even when a uh, state-owned enterprise of the People's Republic of China bought Syngenta, uh, we, we attempted at Monsanto to be the consolidator rather than the consolidatee, uh, but we were acquired by Bayer. And after you know, 20 months of negotiation, uh, the two companies you know, merged with Bayer being the dominant party. Um, I was fortunate enough to be asked to serve as general counsel uh, once that uh, once that merger was completed. Frankly, I was quite surprised to be offered that position since I sat across from sat, I sat across from Bear's leadership for over one and a half years and convinced helped convince them to pay sixty three billion dollars to acquire Monsanto. But it was uh, it was it was fun to. Uh, to take the job as as my last formal job, I uh, I was interested in helping to put together two just awesome legal departments, um, but I was uh, I was uh, chagrined that we ended up with three adverse verdicts involving Roundup uh, all around the San Francisco Bay Area. So suddenly my job changed, and I spent a lot of time on the Roundup mass tort multi district litigation. Um, the company now. Uh, has had seven trial victories in a row, and it appears that that litigation is uh, is going to die of its own weight, and uh, uh, and the MDL mass tort aspect of it be uh, be ended. But I spent most of my four years uh, dealing with uh, dealing with that uh, that issue at uh, at Bear. Um, I'll I'll also talk a little bit about uh, resolving other litigation. Um, the uh, the legacy litigation we had three old manufacturing sites in Illinois, Alabama, and in West Virginia. Uh, some of them involved twenty years of uh, of litigation. Um, I used mediators in each of those, uh, but what I did was um, I was leading the business strategy section at this time, and I insisted and I told our inside counsel. Uh, that we're going to ask the mediator to hold a session, and you're certainly going to be there as inside litigation counsel. Our outside litigation counsel will be there, but I'm going to attend as a business executive, and I want to talk to the plaintiff's lawyers on the other side, and uh, I want to build a relationship with them. I want them Identified myself as the Secretary of State, and I identified the in-house lawyer as the Secretary of War, and uh, made, made clear that uh, I was here with one purpose and only one purpose, and that was to end to end this litigation. And we ended up resolving all of those legacy lawsuits, and that also freed up tremendous resources um, that were no longer being spent simply to uh, defend litigation that should have been brought to an end, frankly, uh, much, much earlier. So Jeff, is the internet, is it still stable for you? Are you able to, is it working okay? It, it's gotten a little spotty in the last minute or two, Scott, but up until then we were hearing you just fine. Okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and stop video for right now. I don't wanna lose, I don't wanna lose the connection. Um, Jeff, I want to leave plenty of time for discussion, and uh, I can go deeper in in talking about relationship-based uh, dispute resolution. Um, I also uh, I also would uh, would love to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, things I like and don't like about mediation process, and uh, some tips for uh, tips for mediators that I've seen uh, that I've seen work well. But uh, Jeff, would it be okay to open the floor at this point to questions? Yeah, why don't we start, Scott? First of all, thank you. This is a rare insight to dispute resolution and conflict prevention at the very highest and most sophisticated levels. 
If you'd like to talk about what you like and don't like on mediators, pluses and minuses of the mediation process, perhaps we ought to give you a few minutes to cover that before we dig into questions and answers on other areas. I would be glad to. I've uh, and I see some familiar faces and names here of folks I've uh, I've worked with uh, worked with before and been in mediation this with. Um, the uh, well, and excuse me, Scott. Why don't we try turning your video on again? Okay, let's do that. There okay. and see if that see if that holds. Um, so. Uh, a couple of things. It's more about mediation process, uh, personalities of of mediators. I um, I really appreciate when a mediator understands that um, this is my dispute. This is <laughs> this is my company. This is uh, this is uh, this is my uh, my problem. And uh, I favor a mediation style. Where the mediators enable uh, enable the parties to have as much dialogue uh, as possible at the right time. There's always a certain pace to a mediation, uh, usually starting with all of the participants in one room together, and then breaking up and into separate rooms. And you you start with the Henry Kissinger style shuttle diplomacy. Uh, that's important. It's an important step in mediation. Oh, you're freezing again, Scott. Um, one thing I generally don't favor here, it's probably on my end. Um, okay, the uh, I don't favor opening statements um, unless they are expressions of intent and and good faith and goodwill. Uh, I also, when when there are opening statements, uh, I also appreciate those being provided by uh, the business leaders and not the lawyers. Um, it's important from my perspective that uh, that the business leaders take uh, take the front seat in mediations as uh, as quickly as possible. Um, I've been to mediations where I have um, had to instruct our outside counsel that uh, they they no longer have a speaking role unless I call on them. Uh, it's the mediation is not the place to, uh, from my perspective, to get into lengthy debates about relative merits. Uh, most mediations I've attended, almost all of them, are with sophisticated parties who have. Uh, very skilled and capable counsel, and uh, you're not going to change someone's mind by making a legal argument at uh, uh, at the mediation. So I mentioned um, getting the principles together as quickly as possible. I have I have resolved by having the mediator facilitate. Meetings that I would have with the lead opponent. Uh, I've resolved more disputes in that fashion than I have uh, via the Kissinger shuttle diplomacy approach. So it's a, uh, and maybe that's a sense more a sense of style. Uh, but I find, I find that if you, if you as a mediator can help facilitate the personal connection between the two principles. Um, if you can find a way to make that work, uh, whether it's putting them together one-on-one -on -one at the right time, whether it's finding common ground on a personal level, uh, I, I really think that the personal aspect of negotiation is, is critical critical to the resolution of disputes. It served me very, very well through many decades. And uh, again, it may be just a matter of uh, a matter of style, but I think there's a role for that personal connection that facilitated by a mediator in every negotiation. Scott, can you give an example? Don't name names inappropriately, of course, but can you give an example of something that a mediator did to facilitate a personal relationship that was really inspired in your view? <laughs> Yeah, um, just about six months ago, um, 
the mediator uh the mediator was and this is <laughs> it's 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 almost it, it, well i'll tell you what it was it, it it's so it's it's very personal but it's um it was a way to break the ice to get to get the two of us talking together um my lead opponent a very capable mass tort lawyer here in the u.s uh he recently became a grandfather and uh i have 11 month old twin granddaughters our first grandchildren and uh the mediator uh learned that during downtime talking to both of us and uh and he he actually got us together in the hall, and we started talking to each other about our grandkids, and uh, and that led to sitting down together uh, at the lunch break, and the conversation went from personal to um, to really a bit of a a bit of a dropping of hands, and it started the direct dialogue uh, instead of the shuttle diplomacy. Uh, we started talking uh, to each other directly rather than through the mediator. Um, so uh, just an unanticipated, <coughs> unanticipated personal touch. Um, I'm always open. I, 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 uh, I'm always open to any dialogue with my opponent. I, um, I find it often uh, disarming to my opponent when the mediator would tell him or her uh scott wants to talk to you one-on-one -on -one. and and often there's a defensiveness there's a concern that you know there's some trickery afoot but it's such it, it, it's just such a human aspect of dispute resolution to want to have from my perspective at least to want to have a direct dialogue especially when I make clear that my only job, I'm not the litigator, I was not the litigator, I was not the trial lawyer. Um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't the person who was, uh, was going to meet them in the courtroom. My goal and my only goal is to settle the dispute. If I, if I leave today without settling your dispute, I have failed. And uh, it's interesting, especially when you're dealing in, uh, with an opponent who is both the negotiator and the litigator that that takes breaking down that instinctive reaction that litigators have to uh to pushing back and fighting rather than building and creating and what's really important to me is to to connect with your opponent in a fashion where you're both understanding that your job is to build and create. And, uh, and it's hard, sometimes it's hard to do. Uh, it's a lot easier if you end up with an opponent who hires a separate settlement counsel <clears throat> or who actually brings a business person to the meeting if you're dealing in company versus company disputes. I am a firm believer that as mediators, you all should, when you're in the position of, for instance, a company to company dispute, that you should strenuously insist that business leaders attend. That uh, make it make it a priority. You could even you could even uh, uh, call it a policy of yours that uh, you you want business representatives who own business representatives who own the dispute and hence own the resolution. Scott, so many mediators, when I talk to other mediators, mediators are always pushing for this sort of thing, having uh, the clients involved, facilitating the personal touch, the direct communication, as you've been discussing. And I think mediators all across the country will tell you they get, we get a lot of pushback from lawyers when we suggest that. Where do you think that comes from? And what do you think we can do about it? Yeah, I think it, it, it comes in part from uh, the desire for the lawyers to be in control. Uh, and, and second, and I mean this with all, uh, with all appropriate respect to the mediators who are on this call from large uh, litigation firms, the business model in uh, most 
in uh, the business model for most litigation firms does not endorse swift and efficient resolution. Okay. I, I don't mean to be snarky about it, but you know, I was at a law firm for a long, long time. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes there are uh, instinctive motivations that litigators have that are not uh, are not the same as the motivations that negotiators have. And this is one of the reasons, Jeff, that I think it's absolutely critical, uh, critical to get business men and women decision makers uh, to whom the lawyers report uh, or who own the dispute uh, in, in the mediation. Uh, I think, I, and I, if I, I'm not a mediator, <laughs> um, if I were, I, I would try to create, uh, if I was in demand, one of the things I would do to, uh, to exercise control of the amount of work that was coming to me, I would, I would not accept mediations unless uh, business representatives were attending. I would make it a policy uh, and I would explain why you know, that, you know, that you're going to get a much better result. You're going to get it faster and less expensive and your chance of resolving the dispute much higher if you bring business owners with you. I, and I think, I, I think if there was a statistical study, it would bear that out. So Scott, in the context of individual mediations, well, first backing up a bit, is it really up to the, business executives and the in-house lawyers to be assertive with their counsel and with mediators to say, you better design a process where I'm involved and here's the role that I would like to play and the role that I would like to discuss you playing. Uh, absolutely, Jeff. And that's what we did at Monsanto. When I, when I, uh, was asked to lead this business strategy team. Um, I was responsible for dispute resolution in the, across the company, and uh, the lawyers operated at my direction in that regard. And uh, I had um, I had uh, you know direct contact with our CEO, chairman of the board, and on significant disputes, um, he was my base of authority. And uh, yeah, so I. That's exactly what we did, and I made clear that in any significant, uh, any significant dispute, um, we would have we would have my settlement team involved for the purpose of seeing if we could resolve that dispute by way of settlement, and uh, and we resolved a lot in that fashion, Jeff, simply by taking control. One thing that you'll you'll find with major companies when a lawsuit comes into the company, what the law department generally doesn't do, and I'm not talking about. Uh, just Monsanto, what the law department generally doesn't do is say, oh, wow, let me see if we could settle this quickly. No, the, the, so the reaction by the law department to a new lawsuit is we're going to fight this and we're going to win this. We're going to beat our opponent. Uh, <clears throat> and consequently, uh, one of the things I did at, uh, at Bayer uh, was we, we had teams working in parallel. We had litigation teams uh, in the law department and we had settlement teams. And there were, there were lawyers who were responsible for the settlement process run in parallel to the litigation process. They weren't in competition. There were parallel processes that worked collaboratively uh, together, and it was very effective. And you know, my, my vision was that lawyers from case to case would change from being a settlement lawyer to being litigation lawyer. So you, it, it was an opportunity to grow and develop and understand uh, risks and benefits of litigation versus resolution and vice versa. <laughs> and it worked very, very, it worked very, very well to have people who's, who were dedicated purely to uh, the resolution process. Do you think that comes just from the culture of lawyering and the culture of legal education that this is uh, a lawsuit looks like a nail that you have to hit with that particular hammer? I think Jeff, it's in part it's in in part that there's a there's also a um, there's also a romance to being uh, a litigator. Uh, you know, there's not not a lot of people think it's sexy to be a negotiator and to resolve disputes. 
uh, the gladiator, the man in the arena, or the woman in the arena, as Teddy Roosevelt would refer to. <clears throat> there's a true, there's a true romance to that. That, frankly, it took me, it took me about uh, about two and a half decades to realize that I could add more value. I could add more value if I dedicated my focus to dispute resolution, and to ending problems, and to putting in place uh, processes to uh, to avoid conflicts uh, before they appear. But uh, I think some of it comes out of law school. Uh, also, the litigation machine in America is a huge money making machine. It is a it is a tremendous. I mean, look at both from the plaintiff side and the defense side. Look at uh, look at the size of litigation departments of most major law firms in the in defense firms in the United States, and you know look at look at the level of success of of some of the most prominent plaintiffs lawyers, whether they be you know the the Mark Lanier's and the Joe Rice's, uh, you know the Pap Antonio's of the world. You know, the, the amount of money they have generated from litigation is just absolutely enormous. They haven't generated that money from settlements. You know, maybe it's settlements after after litigation, but, you know, the you know, their function has been to uh, to create as much risk and as much leverage as possible through litigation. Scott, now let's focus a little bit on individual mediations. Mediators generally like to get people together for some kind of joint session or other, and we can talk about what that means in uh, a minute. But again, we get tremendous pushback from a lot of uh, a lot of mediators, you know, think also think their job is simply to put group A in the West Conference room and group B in the East Conference room and shuttle numbers between them. A lot of lawyers have come to expect that that's what mediation quote unquote is. And it can be a struggle to get people together for that kind of direct communication. What is your view on on how to uh, <clears throat> how to get at least more of those ice breaking joint sessions at the beginning, where at least the business executives can lay eyes on each other, and then we can figure out how to transition into more substantive communications before between the business executives. I guess the first step, and we've already touched on it, uh, Jeff. The first step is you got to get the business executives in the room. <laughs> you know, you got to get them to attend, and that's why I talked about the concept of of, of a policy, uh, somewhat of a policy to try to force that if you can. Um, the uh, the other is to avoid the confrontational initial session uh, of saber rattling. And what I really like, and I do this in every mediation I attend. Um, I, I did it just two weeks ago in one that uh, Lane Phillips was uh, was handling. Uh, we had 35 people in the room, and Lane didn't want opening statements. We we weren't going to give an opening statement that uh, uh, that set out territory or that rattled sabers. Um, I told Lane I want to have three minutes to uh, explain why I'm here and my commitment to do everything I can to get this resolved. And uh, and it actually prompted a couple of people on uh, on the other side to make similar statements. And what it did was it enabled me to uh, make eye contact in a large conference room um, with folks I hadn't met before. Uh, you know, we went around the table and everybody introduced themselves. And of course, you forgot everybody's name immediately. And uh, but it, it it identified for me people who either volunteered to lead or were natural leaders. And uh, and they basically said the same thing that I said. And what it was, was the first creation of common ground. That's what, that's what that did. And some very skilled mediators do is seek those building blocks of common ground. And common ground is not built by saying, uh, Scott offers 100 and uh, and Johnny wants 500. That's not common ground. And, you know, before before dollars are ever exchanged, some of the best mediators I've worked with have tried to find common ground. And often common ground starts with, in complex negotiations, it starts with structure. It starts with a foundation. One of the worst things that you can do in a complex negotiation, I find in my experience, is start out with money. Uh, 
Start out with dollars. Uh, start out with value. It, it it will it will frequently, often crash a negotiation or mediation if you start with with what I submit should be one of the last points that's negotiated. Is you know. If 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 you decide that you're going to buy a car, you don't go to the car dealership and say, uh, "Pay ten thousand dollars for a car." No, you're going to go in there and you're going to say, "I know what car I want to buy." You're going to have a structure in mind before you get to the negotiation of dollars. And I think some of the most skilled mediators I've worked with are ones who look for common ground on a personal level and start with structure. What are some other examples of structure and the kind of business and commercial mediations in, in which you're engaged, Scott? Um, well, let's take, let's take one example I use, patent infringement. <clears throat> um, are the parties, are the, is the patent holder willing to license? And does the, uh, does the uh, violator want a license? Or is it simply the patent holder says, you need to stop and I'm not gonna license you? And I want to monetize this. Um, the, uh, in, for instance, a complex mass tort negotiation. <clears throat> I think it's a mistake to start uh, the negotiations on a per. Oh, Scott, you just froze again. You said it's a mistake to start the negotiation on, and then you just froze. It's a mistake to start the negotiation on um, uh, on a per case average. It's uh, I prefer starting with uh, educating if I'm the defendant in a mass tort, educating the plaintiff on what's important to me. It's not just ending the lawsuits you have. There's a tale. I that I wish to God, you you blacked out again there for a second uh, uh, so I need I need to educate I need to educate my opponent uh, about the structure that's important to me before we get to price so Scott you said that you wanted joint sessions that were basically uh, expressions of goodwill and intent and now you're talking about what seems to be some kind of direct communication or joint session that's going far beyond that. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, it's important to me to, to build, to first build the ability to communicate, to have effective personal communications. Um, it, uh, it's just, I find that negotiations will be slowed or often fail uh, if that initial sense of, and I'll call it trust, that, uh, that you build that personal touch, that personal ability to communicate with your opponent. It, it may take as, as little as a couple of hours of, uh, of communication. It could take several sessions. Um, the, the mediation I mentioned with Lane Phillips a couple of weeks ago, we went for two days and we, we haven't talked dollars yet. We're building a process of being able to communicate and creating a structure. And I suspect we will go on for probably several more two day sessions, uh, to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish. And Jeff, I know we're, I know we're running out of time. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate having this opportunity to to be with you all, and and I wanted uh, wanted Jeff to make sure that I was able to communicate to uh, to your audience the importance of uh, the importance of taking risk in these areas, of of taking the risk to do something a bit different, um, taking the risk to do things that not that maybe are outside of uh, the traditional in terms of what's been uh, what's been done. Uh, I've uh, I've enjoyed the time with you all. I really have, Jeff. It's been uh, thank you for inviting me to do this. Scott, you are so welcome. This was a very enlightening and informative conversation. Thank you so much. I think we covered most of the 
uh, questions that came up in the in the chat, and I was happy to articulate those for people. This was just great, and I'm confident that people will be online very shortly contributing to the Second Harvest Food Bank of New Orleans. We'll put the uh, uh, we'll put the link to that back up in the chat so people can get to it easily. This has been a wonderful presentation, Scott. We thank you and appreciate it very much. And the hour is complete and we are complete. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.